heard his voice at any time, nor seen his shape, and ye have not his word abiding in you, for whom he hath sent him ye believe not. And this is my text for tonight. Search the scriptures, for in them ye think ye have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. They are they which testify of me. If you will hang on one minute, there's something else I need to... Uh, come on now. Clear. <laughs> I knew there was a uh, another scripture I was looking for. Mark 22 and 29, um, excuse me, Matthew 22 and 29. Jesus answering and said unto them, Ye do err, not knowing the scriptures, nor the power of God. So John 5, 39 says, Search the scriptures, for in them ye think ye have eternal life, and they are they which do testify of me, and, and uh, Matthew chapter 22 and verse 29, Jesus said, You do err, not knowing the scriptures, nor the power of God. I want to talk to you tonight about loving the truth. Loving the truth. Of course, Jesus said, John 14, 6, uh, I am the way, the truth, and the life. You cannot love God without loving truth. You cannot love Jesus without loving truth. And you don't really know who Jesus is if you don't know what the truth is. Or should I say who the truth is? So Jesus told the uh the Jews, he said, you need to search the scriptures, for in them ye think ye have eternal life. There's a lot of people that read enough Bible to find a few verses to fit what they want to know. And consequently, since it fits what they want to think, uh, they are satisfied with the fact they have a few scriptures that seemingly confirms their position. And so consequently, uh, they, they think they have eternal life. They read enough scriptures to think they have eternal life. They think they have eternal life. Search the scriptures, for in them ye think ye have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. But Jesus also said, Matthew twenty two twenty nine, 29, you do err... Not knowing. He said this to the same people. You do err not knowing the scriptures nor the power of God. Now I've got to be honest with you. I can go into the Bible and using today's modern methodology, I can prove to you just about anything. There's a, uh, a building that sits right as you come down the hill on, on the beltway near in D.C. You come down that hill. Uh, well, actually, you can see it before you start down the hill. But there's a big religious building that sits right on, uh, as you're coming down the hill of Georgia Avenue going towards uh, Rockville. And... Uh, it comes down the hill, then you turn left in front of that building. And that entire building is built on one verse in the Bible. The entire building's built on one verse. And that verse is found in 1 Corinthians 15, where it talks about people uh, being baptized for the dead. That building is not open to the public. 
You have to be a faithful member of the Mormon church to even have entrance there. And the purpose of that fort building, it cost $14 million in the early 70s. No telling what it would cost today. That doesn't just look like real gold up on top. That is gold. That angel is covered in gold. And all of that was built not for the purpose of welcoming you and I. But there's only two things that take place in that building that's uh, open and available to those outside of the immediate hierarchy of the Mormon faith in this area. And that is, you go there for celestial marriages. You go there to marry for eternity so that in eternity you will have plenty of wives. And the second reason you go there is you go there for the purpose of baptizing, being baptized for your dead relatives who died not being good Mormons. Uh, that's why the Mormon church probably has the most accurate genealogical records you can find about America any place in America. And the reason they have collected these records is so that when you become a Mormon, you can have access to these records to trace your lineage back however far. And if you're willing, you can get baptized for every one of your dead relatives for generations back. And they all come under your faith because you're being baptized. They're being baptized for the dead. All of that building. And the main purpose of it, of course, is not just, is not the pri pri primary purpose is not celestial marriages. The primary purpose is the uh, baptism for the dead. And it's all based on this one single verse that's on the screen. Uh, saying this as delicately as possible, I can take you to a verse in the New Testament, in epistles, that would appear that Paul is saying that if a daughter gets old enough as a part of the family and she is not married and she has never known a man, I could take you to a verse that seems as though it says that a father has the right or even the obligation to give her uh, the experience of knowing a man. I realize that's kind of shocking to you and I intended to shock you with it. There are religious groups that based on those scriptures that practice that. Of course, nowadays, thankfully, uh, it's not practiced very much and those that do practice it, they do their best to keep it quiet because religion or no, faith or no, you could go to jail for that. Unless, of course, the daughter was not under 18 anymore and then... Uh, I'm not sure how much how many laws there are against incest. That isn't something I've looked up lately. But the point I'm trying to make is there are you could, if you want to take one verse, you could teach that doctrine if you want to teach one verse. So there's a lot of people that read the Bible, that preach from the Bible, that believe that because they have scriptures that seemingly back up what they're saying, that they know the truth. And I'll go a little bit farther with you. Just because a great majority of Christians agree that the Bible says something or confirms their particular faith, uh, that doesn't make it true either. Because God's people have never been in a majority. Ever. So the point I'm trying to make to you tonight is this. There has to be something that happens here and here that where they, these two things work together, the heart and the head, that you, are, you desire truth. It doesn't matter what your mom and dad believed. It doesn't matter what your grandmother, grandfather believed. It doesn't matter what your, your neighbors believe, your best friends believe. 
Your salvation is determined strictly by what you find in the scripture and whether or not you believe it and then live by it. I know we are a society and a culture that loves to justify our actions based on the fact that everyone's doing it. It is a part of our culture. It is a part of our attitude. It is a part of our self-justification system that we can excuse all kind of activity because everybody's doing it. Well, 50% of all the people in our society today, all the marriages in our society today end in, end in divorce. That's the first marriages. The second marriages end in higher rate of divorce than that. So based on the fact that everybody seems to be doing it, let's all get divorced. Well, you know how absurd that is. It's absurd. And Jesus said, he told him in chapter 5 of Matthew, search the scriptures for in them ye think ye have eternal life, and they are they which testify me. But then in chapter 22 he said, you're living in error because you don't know the scriptures nor the power of God. You don't know the scriptures nor the power of God. Uh, Well, in John 8, 31, Jesus made this statement. John 8, 31. Then, Jesus, then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him, If you continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed. And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Let me tell you one thing about truth. Truth does not contradict itself. You can't find a verse that says this is this is this is green and another verse that says this is red and they're and, and they're both truth. Truth doesn't contradict itself. Either they're both green or they're both red, but there can't be a, a, a difference. There can't be a contradiction. We have to, we have to search the scriptures until there's no contradiction, until we have truth. When you have truth, no scripture is going to contradict any other scripture on that subject. Now there's a couple of you think I'm shooting at you. I got better stuff to do than shoot at one person. If I got something to say to one person, I say it to you, me and you. The Lord gave me this for all of us. Why? We are not here practicing a religion. This isn't about religion. We're here to know Jesus. We're here to follow Jesus. We're here to practice relationship with Him. We are not here to, to, to follow in uh, uh, just a certain set of doctrines. For instance... 1 John chapter 2, beginning with verse 3, please. 1 John chapter 2, for verse uh, 3. And hereby we do know that we know him. See, it's not about relation, it's not about religion, it's about relationship. Do you know him? How do I know if I know him? Hereby we do know that we know him if we keep his commandments. Next verse. He that saith, I know him and keepeth not his commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. Next verse. But whoso keepeth his word, in him verily is the love of God perfected, hereby know we that we are in him. But what's the big teaching today? The big teaching today is on grace. And here's the way grace is perverted today. Grace is perverted that you're saved by grace and not by works. And this is what that means in their doctrine. That you don't have to do anything to be saved. You can't do anything to be saved. And therefore you can't do anything also to be unsaved. Because you're not saved by grace, you're saved by works, you're saved by grace. What, what, what an absolute lie that is. It's an absolute lie. 
the scripture talks about those that would pervert the grace of God and cause it to be a license to sin. That's exactly what that teaching is. It is a license to sin. I can live however I want to live. I can do whatever I want to do because my salvation is not dependent on what I do anyway. My salvation is strictly by the grace of God, etc., etc., etc. Well, somebody needs to tell the apostle of love that. Back up two verses again, please. Verse 3. Now, this is the apostle of love talking. And we know, in my lifetime, this has been the predominant doctrine, especially in my 40 years in Annapolis, Maryland. When I got here, the charismatic movement was going big and everybody was preaching this doctrine. It's not about doctrine, it's about love. Doctrine divides, love unites. Somebody needs to tell Jesus that one too. He said, I came not to bring peace but a sword. Or how about this one? God is such a good God. He won't send anybody to hell. You know what people are telling you when they say stuff like that? They're in error. They don't know the scripture, neither the power of God. They don't know the scripture. They don't know what the Bible says. They're preaching out of their own human intellect, from their own human emotions. They don't have the truth. They don't know the truth, and they're not saved. I'm not standing here tonight to try to condemn you. I'm not talking to all those people. I'm talking to you. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm not willing to go to Atlantic City and put my life on a number and roll the dice. I'm not willing to go to Atlantic City and put my life on a number and spin the roulette wheel. I'm not willing to put my life down and then play uh, uh, blackjack. Thank you. I'm not willing to do that. I'm not willing to gamble with my eternity. I'm 65. It went like that. Eternity is forever. I can't even imagine how long unlimited numbers of 65 are. I don't know how long that is. I told my wife the other day, I've been in situations where I've heard people talking about somebody that they knew that was 65 or reading something about where somebody's talking about being 65 and and I'm reading that, and they're talking about how old that person is and, 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 and all this kind of stuff, and, and I, I, I'm, I'm listening to that, and then all of a sudden, somewhere in the back of my brain, this little voice says, you're 65. And then the next thing that comes, is this what everybody thinks about somebody 65? Because that's not me. That's not me. 65 is a number. If you've got a problem with it, that's your problem. I'm just telling you something. If you think you're old, try 65. Got a few of you here, not very many, but a few older than that. It's, you know what? It sounds like a long time. It's not a very long time at all. And I'm going to spend eternity somewhere forever. And then the determination of where I spend eternity forever is going to be determined by some roll of the dice. Some, some religious roll of the dice. Well, that doctrine sounds nice and it lets me live like I want to live, do what I want to do, and tell still t and, and, it still tells me I'm saved. So I tell you what, because that sounds good, I'm going to roll the, the religious dice and, 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 and gamble my eternal salvation on such stuff as that. You know, he says, <laughs> he says, um, Except the man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. You know, the religious world today, the, 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 the liberal religious world, they, they, they have adopted the humanistic doctrine that's, that teaches this, that there are no absolutes. There are no absolutes. Well, 
if you've ever heard that statement, you can mark that off as the stupidest statement you've ever heard in your life. You know why? Because the statement, there are no absolutes, is an absolute statement. And a self-contradicting statement, any self-contradicting principle, is automatically a lie. I don't even have to argue with somebody about the existence of absolutes. Once they say to me, there are no absolutes, they just contradicted themselves. You can't use an absolute statement to, to make the statement there are no absolutes without being in contradiction. But if you, if you don't care about truth and you're just looking for a way to excuse yourself to live any way you want to live and do whatever you want to do and still believe you're going to be saved, then you're willing to believe the lie that there are no absolutes. Well, I'm going to tell you something. I love the Bible. You may believe in the gray. I like gray to wear. But I don't want to live gray. And just in case it matters to you, I don't have any gray hair. It's silver. And whatever you think you're seeing is wrong. No gray. It's silver. Hallelujah. My wife is silver blonde. This book is full of statements that are absolutes. And you and I have to make a decision. We're either going to believe what it says, or we don't believe what it says. There is no middle ground. Because when the scripture makes absolutes, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart with all thy soul, with all thy mind, with all thy strength. And thou shalt love thy neighbor as thy... You know what? Those are not statements that have any gray area in them. They're either true or they're not true. There is no half truth. There's no three quarters truth. There's no one quarter truth. It's something, something that makes that kind of statement, any statement that makes that kind of positive, absolute statement is either true or it's a lie. But not in the religious world today. Not in the religious world today. I, 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 don't, I, I don't want to make a big comment about this, and I'm sure that there's probably not anybody in this room that's not aware that uh, the mastermind or the head guy that uh, planned the 9-11 attacks on the U.S. was killed last night. Excuse my pride but it was U.S. Navy SEALs that did it. You say, you're a Christian. You're rejo No, I'm not, I'm not rejoicing over the man dying. Really, I'm not. Because today he knows his doctrine wasn't truth. And he, know he, died, he knows t today, right now, this moment, he knows <clears throat> he died for a lie. I know that's a bold statement. I'm making it anyway. It is also on the internet. I'm making it anyway. He died for a lie. Yes, he did. And, 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 and here's, here's the bottom line. You can believe anything you want to while you're breathing. Free country here especially. You can believe whatever you want to. You can believe the moon is made of cheese if you want to. You can preach and believe the, the world is flat if you want to. Nobody can keep you from believing what you want to. You can believe anything you want to while you're breathing. You can preach any doctrine you want to while you're breathing. You can preach that it's okay to kill people, to threaten people out. You're either going to die or you're going to convert to my faith, which is what's been happening. 
I've been there. I've been to nations where they do that. Where if you convert from Islam, you will be killed. I've been there. In fact, it is not exactly the most comfortable thing I have ever realized in my life. But in January, I was staying in a house for a whole week, just a few miles. Just a few miles from where all this went down last night. And I'm telling you something right now. You can believe anything you want to while you're breathing. But when the breath is gone, and the book says it's appointed unto man once to die, and after that the judgment, in this life, you believe what you want to believe. But in his life, in his dimension, the only thing truth is what God says is true. And the Bible says at the judgment, when a person is confronted for the lies, they won't make any excuses. The scripture says they will be speechless. <laughs> I don't know about you, okay? I don't know what your, your intention is. I don't always do what's right. I don't always live it like I'm supposed to live it. I, I, I got I, my, my spirit but wants one thing and, and desires one thing. But sometimes this body I live in, it, it doesn't always cooperate. That's not okay. But thank God for the blood. That's not okay. But the point I'm making, trying to make is this. <laughs> I want to go to heaven. I want to go to heaven more than anything else in this world. I didn't say I'm, I, 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 didn't, I don't mean that I want to die this instant. But when I die, nothing, and excuse me, nobody is more important to me than going to heaven. I love my wife. <laughs> but the book says... After we leave here, we're not going to be husband and wife. And I'm not giving up my eternity for my wife. And I would believe and pray that she wouldn't give up her eternity for her husband. And I'm not giving up my eternity for my children. And I pray that my children wouldn't give up their eternity for their parents. And while the scripture says that in heaven we will know even as we are known, I will know her, I will know she was my wife, but she will not be my wife. Together, we will be a part of the body of Christ, and as the body of Christ, we will be a part of the bride of Christ, and the only person we will be married to in heaven is Jesus, period. So that being the case, after 42 plus years of marriage, and as much as I love her, and I would be willing to give my natural life for her in a heartbeat, and she knows that's true, I will not give my eternity for her. I would die physically to protect her. But I'm not going to sell my soul to stay with her if it ever came to that. Not going to do it. That's pretty hard, brother, right? No, that's how long eternity is. I'm talking about loving the truth. I'm talking about loving the truth. Hello? I'm talking about loving the truth. And so Jesus said, again, John 8, 31, 32, Then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him if ye continue in my word then are ye my disciples indeed it's not how you start it's how you finish when I was in high school I, I ran the 440 and that will tell you how old I am we didn't run the 400 meter we ran 440 yards that's a quarter of a mile on most normal tracks that you would see at school that's one time around the big oval. 
problem with a with a 440 or the 400 meters is it's too short to be a distance run and it's too long to be a sprint. So the only way you run the quarter mile or the 440 or the 400 meters, whatever you want to call it, 440 meters is not equivalent to four, four, 400 meters is not equivalent to 440 yards, but they're kind of close. They're not very much difference. And and in order to run that race, the gun sounds you run as hard as you can, as far as you can, and hope you don't collapse before somebody else does. Because trust me, you come around, you're on the backside, you're, you're exactly 220 yards away from the finish line, and you've been running as hard as you can for 220 yards. And you're thinking to yourself, I don't know if I'm going to make it to the finish line, because you're not pacing yourself. You're running as hard as you can. And then when you, you go all the way around that last turn and you finally get to the straightaway and you're looking at the finish line and it's still uh, probably 60, 70 yards away and your mind is saying run faster and your body's saying you're kidding, right? And it feels like you're in one of those dreams where you're, need, you're, getting, you're getting away from the monster and your body will barely move. It feels like that. And this was way back before they had the nice rubberized tracks to run on. We ran on cinders. And that's little tiny pieces of stone or rock or something. I'm not exactly what cinders are, sure what they are. All I know is they're really little tiny sharp pieces of stone, very small. And that if you fall face down in the cinder, you will have little black spots in your hands and knees for the rest of your life. Because those things embed into your skin. And so at some point with that finish line ahead of you, you stop thinking about winning the race. You stop thinking about whether or not you're, what position you're going to finish in. You're just thinking about this. Let me get to the finish line and off this cinder's before I collapse. Because I don't want to be damaged. Now, thankfully, I never fell, but I was, I've been around a couple of guys that have. It wasn't a pretty sight. And you do everything in your power, no matter how badly your hands are hurt, to keep your face out of that. Well, let me tell you something. Sometimes the, the Christian life is just like that. It's really not. You're not really competing against anybody. The whole idea is to finish the race. You want to finish. You want to finish. He said, if you continue in my word, then are you my disciples indeed. The next word, verse says this. Ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall what? Make you free. The truth shall make you free. Ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Ye shall know the truth, the truth shall make you free. Question, if you're not free, do you know the truth? You know what, that, that's, that's a pretty absolute statement, isn't it? Ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Not ye, you, you can know some of the truth, and it might make you free. Or at least it'll make your life better. It didn't say anything like that. There's nothing in there like that. It's an absolute statement. You shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. I don't know about you, but... Uh, I really want to be free. John 16, 13. I love this verse. This is a verse that has motivated my search for God and my study as long as I can remember. Howbeit when He, the Spirit of truth, has come, He will guide you into all truth. For He shall not speak of Himself, but whatsoever He, he shall hear 
that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. Now, that, that's a pretty amazing statement right there. I am not standing here tonight telling you I know all truth. I don't have it. But I'm going to tell you something else I do, do believe. I'm standing here telling you tonight I have a promise that if I will pursue him, seek him, search his word, search him out, and follow the, the direction of his spirit as he leads me in his word, I have a promise to know all truth. Now, does that mean I will understand exactly how the worlds were formed? Nah. Does that mean I will know everything there is to know about the details of eternity? Nah. I don't believe that that's what he's promising here. I believe he's made a promise that if I will pursue him and let his spirit lead me, his spirit of truth lead me, that he will lead me into all the understanding of all of the truth necessary to assure my eternal destination. It was uh, May of 1980. We were having a major revival, and the theme of the, the revival was end time. And uh, we somehow, I forget exactly how, but we... We were able to secure a room off the student union, uh, main area of the student union at uh, University of Maryland College Park. And we went over and spent most of the day during uh, one of the off days of the revival talking to college students about the coming of the Lord. And uh, we had people out passing out flyers and, and, and it would direct them to the room. And, and we primarily just uh, talked with them and ask them about things and they ask us questions and we try to answer them and, and we had some pretty good dialogue but there was one young man came in and he unfortunately he's the only one I really remember but he came in and, and we talked for a few minutes and he made this pronouncement he said well I believe in Jesus but I don't believe in the Bible I said pardon me he said I believe in Jesus but I don't believe in the Bible I said, well, I have a little bit of problem with that. He said, what's that? I said, to my knowledge, the Bible is the only source of reliable information about who and what Jesus was and is. So how do you believe in Jesus if you don't believe in the Bible? He says, oh, I believe there was a real Jesus. And I said, well, if you don't believe in the Bible, how, how do you know anything about him? I mean, how do you know what he is, what he, what he stands for, whatever? He says, well, I just create that in my mind. He becomes whatever I think he is. I got to be honest with you, I... I didn't really have a whole lot I could say to that. You know why? Here's why. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 7. 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 7. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. Do you have a, another translation up there? What translations do you have? If you got the Amplified, let me, let me have that. Or uh, even, I guess, the Message Bible, if you have that or whatever. I thought you had other translations. I've got other translations. Hang on. Amplified says this, verse 7. For the mystery of lawlessness, that hidden principle of rebellion against constituted authority, 
is already at work in the world, but it is restrained only until he who restrains is taken out of the way. And then uh, let's do... Uh, Let's do the good news translation. The mysterious wickedness is already at work, but what is going to happen will not happen until the one who holds it back is taken out of the way. Then we'll look at, oh, the Message Bible. It's always got something weird to say. That doesn't mean that the spirit of anarchy is not now at work. It is, secretly and underground. Don't forget that the Message Bible and the, the, new lim the Living Bible our, trend, our, our, our paraphrase uh, versions of the Bible, they are not a translation. Read them, but only read them with the understanding that they are not translations, they are paraphrases. That's, that's like this. I could say to you, the temperature in here uh, before the air conditioner was turned on was... Uh, 72 degrees, but right now with the air conditioning set properly and the ceiling fans on, it is now 70 comfortable degrees. A paraphrase of that would be, it was hot, now it's cool. Seriously, that's the difference between a translation and a paraphrase. So as long as you understand that, you're welcome to read it. But here's what the New Living Translation says. For this lawlessness is already at work secretly and it will remain secret until the one who is holding it back steps out of the way. And then uh, we go back to uh, the uh, next verse. And, well, first of all, let me say this. This word mystery of iniquity or this uh, spirit of lawlessness, the word iniquity means this. According to the Greek, it means Someone who is not willing to be under the authority of the law. Or a paraphrase of iniquity would be this. Nobody's telling me what to do. And the Bible says that attitude doesn't come from education. It doesn't come from the Constitution. The Bible does, says that that attitude does not come from culture. The Bible says that attitude is a work of the spirit of the Antichrist. And our world, especially our country, is full of it. Nobody's telling me what to do. Nobody's telling me how to dress. Nobody's telling me how to think. Nobody's telling me anything. I'm smart enough to make my own decisions. That's right. I hope your brain works really good where you're going. Because let me tell you something. Lawlessness, <laughs> hear me. The one who makes the laws does so partly for the purpose of demonstrating their authority. You can't make laws unless you have the power and the authority to do that. Now, there are a lot of other motives that God has for the Word of God and what He says in the Word of God. But I'm going to tell you something. When it comes to the concept of iniquity, what iniquity is resisting is it's saying to God, you don't have the power or the authority to tell me how to live. I will live any way I want to live and you're going to accept it. You're going to like it. You don't have any choice. Well, you want to live that way? I'll tell you what let's do. You come up here and lay on the floor and I'll take a knife with a 12-inch blade and we'll toss it up in the air and see if it comes down on the handle or on the point? Well, that's ridiculous, Brother Wright. I'd never do that. Oh, well, you're what? You'd be a lot better off doing that than gambling your eternity on iniquity? On an attitude that says, nobody's telling me what to do. Nobody's telling me what's right and wrong. I make my own mind up on what's right and wrong. 
And you know what? Which I've learned in 40 plus years of ministry. People don't exactly appreciate it when you try to tell them the truth, even if the motive is to help them go to heaven and not go to hell. Because people don't want to be told that's wrong. This is what you're supposed to do. This is what you... No, nobody's telling me what to do. The, for this lawlessness, that's the New Living Translation, for this lawlessness is already work at work secretly and it will remain secret until the one who is holding it back steps out of the way. That's called the rapture, my friend. Verse 8, King James, And then that wicked one, and then that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. Even him, verse 9, even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders. You know what scripture says? If a prophet comes to you and prophesies and his prophecy comes to pass and then after he's prophesied and his prophecy comes to pass, he says, this is Leviticus 18, he says to you, let's go over here and serve this God. Now wait a minute. He prophesied. The prophecy come to pass. And he says to you, let's go serve this God. Leviticus 18 says, it's the Lord your God testing you. Because you see, the Word of God is superior to any demonstration of what may appear to be the power of God. I'll say this to you one more time. I don't care what they do on TV. I don't care what, what they promise you with their offerings. I don't care what they say. I don't care what they preach. I don't believe any of it. I, I don't care if they lined up a thousand people and every last one of them walked. If when they're through with that demonstration, they say, it doesn't really matter how you're baptized, and it really doesn't matter what you call the name of the God you worship, this is what the Word of God says. Be careful. Because God sent them to test your spirit. Listen. I'm reading again. Verse 9. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan, with all power and signs and lying wonders. Listen to this, verse 10. And with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish. How can you be deceived? How is it possible to be deceived by a feeling? I just came back from Houston, Texas. Houston is the home of the guy that took the big basketball arena and turned it into a church. I don't really think I have to say the name, do I? No. And you know what these guys told me down there? Now that guy's dad, he was for real. He preached the word of God. But this fella, he didn't preach the Bible. He preaches this feel-good stuff, this success-oriented feel-good stuff. God's here to make your life wonderful. Well, you know what? If that's what God has promised, then he's failed me. Because I've had ten times more hard days than easy days. You, you still trust him? Yeah. Because I love my children. And I promise you something. Even though I loved my sons enough to give my life for them, while they were under my roof, they had probably 10 to 1 hard days to easy days. I was never abusive to them. But I had high expectations for them. The pastor and I were talking about his eldest son who I don't see in here. Good. Right? Timothy, he's in the office. Okay, good. And uh, we were talking about him, and he's in a basketball league on the weekends for the spring. And his dad said to me, well, he's not really giving it his best. 
he's the best guy on the team, and he's really discouraged because these other guys aren't very good. And I said, I, I, I just want to remind you something, something, son. I made it very clear to you and your brother many times that you guys didn't have to do anything to win my love or approval. If you played sports, fine. If you didn't play sports, that was fine with me. It was okay. I wasn't going to love you anymore because you, you, you did, and I wasn't going to love you any less because you didn't. But here's the point, and I made it to you and your brother, and it's time you step up and be a dad and make this very clear to your son. Whether or not you play is your decision, but if you're going to play, you're going to give it your best or you're not going to play. Not for you to be better than anybody else, but just for you to grow and you to improve and you to find out what hard work is supposed to be about. Either you're not going to play, and that's fine. Our relationship won't change one bit if you don't play. We're going to love each other, and we're going to be friends, and we're going to be dad and son, and it's all going to be fine. I am not living vicariously through you, and I will not live vicariously through you. It's your life. It's your decision. However, as your dad, if you decide to play, and there's a couple of guys that played with one or more of my boys sitting here. I didn't ride everybody else like I rode those boys. Some of you have heard David say it. He can still hear in his sleep. Use the backboard. I don't care how beautiful the finger roll looked. It's a low percentage shot. I didn't care who was listening. I could feel people cringe. Boy, he's a demanding father. No, I'm not. No, I wasn't. I wasn't a demanding father at all. He didn't want to play. It was fine with me. It was fine with me. But if you choose to play, you're going to put up with me because it's my job as a dad to help you to understand you're going to give this your best. You owe that to yourself and you owe that to your teammates and you owe that to your future. And with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them but perish, why do they perish? Because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. I, the title of this lesson was Loving the Truth. Hear me tonight. I beg of you people of God. If you don't love the truth, you need to beg God for a love for the truth. Because if you don't love the truth, you're going to end up deceived and lost. The Bible says, buy the truth and sell it not. Is there a price tag on, on your love for the truth? Is there a price that you can say, this is how high, I'm willing, far I'm willing to go to have truth, but if the price raises any higher, I'm out. This is not a game of poker, and somebody just called your bluff and you fold. The consequences are eternity. The consequences are eternity. Verse 10 again, And with all deceivableness and unrighteousness in them that perish, because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. And for this cause, these, this is one of the scariest verses in all of the Bible. And for this cause, God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned who believed not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. I want you to hear me right now. If your first and foremost love is not truth, if you don't love the truth to the point that you're not willing to accept anything but the truth, regardless of the price you pay for truth, you are susceptible to God, 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 Sending you a strong delusion. And you will believe the lie. You will believe it because it came from God. And you will believe the lie. And you will be damned because you love not the truth. Do you understand 
when God sends to you or allows a spirit of deception to come to you, a spirit of delusion, because you don't love truth, do you understand there's no way back from that? There's no way back from that. When God himself is the one that decided to send you the spirit of delusion, and you're going to believe that spirit of delusion because God sent it. Do you understand there's no way back from that? One more time before I quit. Verse 10 through 12, please. Verse 10. With all this, no, I'm going to read verse uh, 7. I'm going to go down quickly if you'll let me read them. For the mystery of iniquity that hath already worked, only he who now let it will let until he be taken out of the way. And then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. For this cause, God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie that they all might be damned who believed not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. It is a painful, painful thing when someone you love, someone you prayed for, worked with, cared about, does not love the truth enough to the point that they open themselves up to this and you watch it happen. And now there is nothing you can say and nothing you can do because you have to acknowledge to yourself God sent this and they were susceptible to it because they didn't love the truth. And it's over. It's over. No way out. No way back. The only thing left is a fearful looking to for judgment. I'm saved today. I'm in a saved condition through the blood of Jesus Christ, through trust and faith in Him, through love of His Word and willingness to obey anything he says. And all of it's based on this. I love truth. I love truth. If I was studying the Word of God today, and God showed me conclusively something in this book that I have never taught, and maybe even contrary to what I've taught, But God showed it to me, and I knew it was God. Regardless of what it would do, regardless of the price I would pay, I would stand and preach that if everybody left. Why? Because I love the truth. It's the truth that saves. It's the truth that delivers. It's the truth that sets free. Let's stand. Could we raise our hands and ask the Lord tonight for Him to give us a love for the truth? A love for the truth that will supersede anything and everything. A love for the truth that's greater than everything. A love for the truth. I want the truth, Lord. I want to know the truth about myself. I want to know the truth.